Good morning, everyone. Good morning. If you would, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy. We're going to be in chapter 2. We're going to be looking at the section of 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 4 through 8. Part 2. Let's pray as we get into the word here this morning. Lord God, again, we thank you for this opportunity, this privilege that we have to come before you, Lord, to worship. Lord, through music, through the hearing of your word, through prayer, through the taking of communion, God, I just pray that in this hour, in this time that we're gathered together, that we would remember what that privilege actually is, or that it truly is a blessing to us, or we may not take it for granted. So God, I pray that you would help focus our hearts this morning, you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear, and that you would just remove any distractions that may be going on around us. Again, God, we thank you for all that you've done and continue to do, and we just ask that you would speak to us through your holy, inspired, and authoritative word. We thank you, Jesus, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Now, before we begin, I just want to give a little bit of a disclaimer uh, here this morning. This is uh, going to be a sermon that I'm not going to say it's going to be super long, but it uh, covers a lot of really important uh, topics and um, passages that uh, I just really want to encourage everyone to really put on your thinking caps here this morning, because again, we're going to be covering a lot of ground, and it's going to be a lot to get into, and we're not really going to be able to cover it all as much as I would like. We're just going to be able to get a kind of a brief overview, so... With all of that, I want to also recap kind of what we've been looking at thus far. Again, last week we looked at 1 Timothy 2, and we looked at verses 4 through 8 as a whole. And again, this week we're going to continue with that and look at part 2, taking a deeper dive, specifically looking at verses 5 and 6. But as we talk about this section of Scripture, again, I want to remind you of the context and some of the things we've already seen. We previously saw that it would seem uh, best and consistent with the text and the flow of the passage to best understand the phrase, all men, to mean all kinds of people, or all types and classes of people. Again, we see this at the end of verse 1, that our prayers are to be made on behalf of all men, and then in verse 4, a God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And then we also see this concept of all in verse 6, which we're going to look at here today. But that phrase, again, is best understood to mean all kinds, types, classes of people. Again, we see that in verse 1, and then in verse 2, that is clarified. We're to pray on behalf of all men who are some of the types or classes of people that we're to pray for. Verse 2, we're told, for kings and all who are in authority. And our prayer prayer for all types and kinds of people doesn't just include kings and those who are in authority, but it also includes the nations. As Paul would say, actually, in verse 7, we are to pray for all people of every tribe and tongue and nations, which is why he makes that reference in verse 7. For this, I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, I'm, I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying, as a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Again, some of these things could seem disconnected if we don't really look at the whole. And so we need to, again, look at the flow of the passage and put it together verse by verse. But it's not disconnected. Again, him bringing up the Gentiles further uh, shows our need to pray for all kinds and types of people. And again, his reference to the Gentiles would be different ethnic types of people. And so really the whole section from verses 1 through 8 in chapter 2 here in 1 Timothy is about praying for the lost. And when we come together in corporate worship like we are right now, it's the men who are the ones that have been given this responsibility. Look at verse 8 of chapter 2. Therefore, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. Again, as I mentioned last week, we do pray for our leaders. We do pray for the lost. We do pray for a number of people um, 
when we have our pastoral prayer. And that's a part of us wanting to be faithful to this command here in Scripture to pray for types of people. And again, as we think about what Paul is commanding us to do here, our need to pray for the lost, to pray for the salvation of every kind of people, it stems from the heart of God, again, going back to verse 4, who desires to save all kinds of people. Again, it's all connected. And as I mentioned last Sunday, I do not believe the word desire here is simply something that God wishes or wants to happen. Again, I mentioned that there's two reasonable explanations. I do believe that that is a reasonable explanation, that it's just simply something that God does desire, he wishes, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it will come about. But as I had also said, I do not believe that's the best way to interpret the passage. Psalm 135.6 says, Whatever the Lord pleases, or whatever the Lord desires, he does. I believe God desires to save all kinds of people, and that's exactly what he does. He does save all kinds of people. He saves people of all different kinds of shapes, and sizes, colors, and etc. And at the end of it all, we see that the multitude of the people that God has saved is so vast that it can't even be counted. We see this just as one example, Revelation 7, verse 9. In the way that God has accomplished his desire to save such a numerous amount of all types of people was through the giving up of his son. And this, of course, was his one and only son, Jesus Christ, who came into the world to be born as human. And as time went on, God the Son, he grew as a man, always being sinless and righteous. And then when he was about 30 years old, he started his earthly ministry. From there then, at the end of about three and a half years, he set his face, he was determined to go to Jerusalem. And he made his way to go to die on the cross. And then having entered into the city on Palm Sunday, today, he was moving ever closer to the flawless completion of the, the mission that the Father had set out for him. And having accomplished and carried out all of God's will, he died on the cross, and then three days later he rose again, becoming for all who believe the source of eternal salvation. And now he lives to mediate, to intercede, on behalf of everyone who believes. And that's what brings us here to our verse here today. And let's pick up in 1 Timothy 2, beginning with verse 5. Paul says, For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Paul continues to make clear the consistent testimony of Scripture, stating that there is one God and only one God. And it is through the one true God that all men must come to for salvation. But how does anyone come to God? Well, the Bible tells us in John 14, 6, no one comes to the Father but through Christ, through Jesus. And Jesus also tells us that no one is able to come to him unless they are drawn by the Father, John 6, 44. And so God's word is clear. Man has no capacity or ability in and of himself to come to God or to make himself right with God, which is where the Lord comes in. Because just as there is only one true God who ever has or ever will exist, there is also only one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. And as I mentioned briefly last week, a mediator is someone who steps in the middle of opposing parties and seeks to reconcile the two and their differences. Paul tells us there is no one else who is able to stand in the middle between us as guilty condemned sinners and God, the perfect and righteous judge. Acts 4.12 says there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. 
Jesus is the only mediator. It is only the man, Christ Jesus, who is capable of being that mediator for us and our advocate with the Father, 1 John 2, 1. And as our mediator, it must be understood that Christ Jesus was a man. And Paul takes time here to specifically point out the humanity of Christ. Now, now, just for a moment, be careful here, because he's not in any way denying that Jesus is God. But as I just said, it must also be emphasized that Jesus was the man. He's the man, Christ Jesus. Jesus had to be both fully God and fully man in order to be our mediator. And you might ask, well, why? why is that? Well, I, again, I'm glad that you did. You guys are such a helpful bunch here. <laughs> Jesus had to be both fully God and man because he was the only one who could represent both God and men perfectly. No one else could do that. No one could represent God perfectly, and no one else could represent man perfectly. There's no one else except for the one mediator between God and men, the man, the God-man. Christ Jesus. He was the only one who could be both the spotless sacrifice that we need and the one who offered up himself as that blameless offering. And he didn't just offer it up to anyone. Again, he made the sacrifice on our behalf, men, to God the Father. No one else could do that but Christ. How did he accomplish that? Well, again, God, having taken on human flesh as a man, could die as a substitute for our sins. So for Jesus to be our mediator, to reconcile us to God, there had to be the shedding of blood. There was no other way that we could be forgiven. Hebrews 9.22 says, For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Because that's what sin costs. The wages, or the payment, for our sin is death, Romans 6, 23. So someone had to pay. It's either going to be the sinner, or the sinner who trusts in Christ, who paid for it on their behalf. God, obviously, cannot die. God is eternal. That's why Jesus became flesh, so that he could die as a man, in our place. Turn with me very quickly to Hebrews chapter 2. We've looked at this passage a number of times, but it's so important for us to see what Scripture says, and again, how consistent it is. Hebrews chapter 2, starting in verse 14. For the sake of time, I'm going to go ahead and read it, but uh, feel free to continue to get there. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 says, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he, referring to Jesus, himself likewise also partook of the same, which would be flesh and blood, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to, to slavery all their lives. And then skip down to verse 17. Therefore he, Jesus, had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. And so again, as Jesus being also God, God could not stay dead, because as I mentioned, God is eternal, and could never be bound by death. We see this in Acts 2.24, death could not hold him. But as God and man, he fulfilled all the requirements of God, and became our faithful high priest who made the propitiation for our sins. Now that word propitiation is a hundred dollar word. It's a very, very important word. It's a very, very um, uh, challenging word. And it's a word that uh, a lot of people can miss when we talk about this in what Jesus has done for us in the atonement. And this, as I mentioned, propitiation is an extremely important word but it's not really uh, something that we can fully flesh out in all of its significance today. But simply put, it's a word that means to appease, 
or to turn away wrath. And so Jesus, he had interceded, he mediated on our behalf as the, our, our sinless high priest by making the full payment of our sin. And as a result of that payment, he removed the wrath of God from all who believe. And for us to more fully understand what Jesus did for us on the cross as high priest, we need to look at some Old Testament passages. So if you would go ahead and turn to Leviticus chapter 16. But we need to look at some of these verses to see some of, again, the significance of what the high priest did on behalf of the people. One of the greatest responsibilities of the high priest were the sacrifices that he and the other priests would make for themselves and for the people of Israel. And the most important time of the year in all of the sacrifices that were made was the Day of Atonement. And that's what we're going to briefly uh, read about here in Leviticus chapter 16, starting in verse 11. Leviticus 16, verse 11 says, Then Aaron, who was the first high priest, shall offer the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself and for his household. And he shall slaughter the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself. He shall take a fire pan full of coals of fire upon the altar before the Lord, and two handfuls of finely ground sweet incense, and bring it inside the veil. He shall put the incense on the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat, that is, the ark of the testimony, otherwise he will die. Moreover, he shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the mercy seat on the east side, also in front of the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. Then he shall slaughter the goat of the, the sin offering, which is for the people, and bring its blood inside the veil, and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull, and sprinkle it on the mercy seat in front of the mercy seat. He shall make atonement for the holy place because of the impurities of the sons of Israel, and because of their transgressions in regard of all their sin. And thus he shall do for the tent of meeting which abides with them in the midst of their impurities. And then skip down to verse 29. This shall be a permanent statute for you. In the seventh month, on the tenth year of the month, you shall humble your souls and do not any work, whether the native or the alien who so sojourns among you. For it is this day that atonement shall be made for you to cleanse you, and you will be clean from all of your sins before the Lord. It is a Sabbath, solemn, a solemn rest for you, that you may humble your souls, as it is a permanent statute. So the priest who is anointed and ordained to serve as priest in his father's place shall make atonement, and he, and he shall thus put on the linen garments and the holy garments, and make atonement for the holy sanctuary. And he shall make atonement for the tent of the meeting and the altar, and he shall also make atonement for the priests and for all the people of the assembly. Now you shall have this as a permanent statute to make atonement for the sons of Israel for all their sins once a year. And just as the Lord commanded Moses, so he did. So to sum all that up, again, we're not going to be able to get into all the specifics of everything that we just read. But the high priest would slaughter the sacrifices for sin and sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant before the Lord. And it was in between the two cherubim. And this was something that they had to do once every year. This was the time of year that the sin of the people would be covered temporarily. This was the time of year that the people would have their sins atoned for. That the high priest again would take the blood to make payment on behalf of their sins. And again, it would temporarily make amends between sinful Israel and holy and righteous Yahweh. And this was only but a picture or a shadow of what was to come. All the Old Testament and all the Old Covenant sacrificial system was for the most part set in place to reveal the inability of man to make himself pure before God. 
It was created and implemented intentionally to show how insufficient animal sacrifices and our ability to carry out such sacrifices truly are. But God used it for a time, and he had passed over former sins until the more perfect, complete atonement was made by the perfect high priest, our mediator, the man, Christ Jesus. Just listen as I read what Paul says in this regard in Romans chapter 3. Again, we're going to be looking at quite a lot of verses. That's why I said you got to you got to put on your thinking caps here, guys. Just stay with me here. Romans chapter 3, verses 24 through 26 says, Being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness, because in the forbearance of God, he passed over uh, sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness, at the present time, he would be the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And so really Paul is commenting about the old sacrificial system and how God had formerly passed over those sins. The old covenant was set in place temporarily, leading us to see that our greatest need to have our sins forgiven could only be completed in Christ. And Christ has done that. And he passed over those former sins, and all of those former sins and future sins were now covered under the blood of Jesus for the atonement, the propitiation that he made on our behalf. And again, as we look into the book of Hebrews, which we're going to be looking at several verses here this morning, but Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6 says, referring to Jesus, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry by as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which is enacted on better promises. And in chapters 1 through 7, leading up to chapter 8 in the book of Hebrews, show how Jesus is superior to everything else, specifically regarding the Old Covenant. Jesus is greater than the angels. He's greater than Moses. He's greater than the law. He's greater than the Levitical priesthood. And although Jesus did not descend from the tribe of Levi, God had made him a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So we have Jesus, the king of Israel, again, from the tribe of Judah, the line of David, was also high priest. And he was high priest who was also mediator of a better covenant with better promises. Why? Why is Jesus a better mediator with better covenant promises? Well, look at what he did. Again, turn to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 through 14, I'm sorry, 15 actually, show us exactly what he did. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11, But when Christ appeared as high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and bulls, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained or secured an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and uh, ashes of heifers sprinkling those who have been defiled, sanctified for their cleansing of flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So again, what he's saying is the reason Jesus is a better mediator, he's a better, uh, he is enacted with a better covenant, with better promises, because Jesus' blood actually atoned for sins, unlike the blood of goats and bulls. It actually made the perfect atonement, the perfect propitiation for sin. How much more, verse 14, will the blood of Christ cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Verse 15, for this reason... He is the mediator of a new covenant, so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Jesus did 
what the other high priests, through their animal sacrifices, could never do. He actually and finally took away sin because he actually made a full and complete atonement for it. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. For the law, since is always only a shadow of the good things to come, and not only very the, the very form of things, can never by the same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, they would not have ceased to be offered, because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have consciousness of sin. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year. Again, it was temporary. They had to have this done every year, because the blood of goats and bulls could never satisfy the payment for sin. Verse 4, For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. And then skip down in chapter 10 to verse 11 through 14. It said, Every priest stands daily ministering, offering time after time the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies would be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering... He has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And my friends, that is good news. I mean, think about it. If we still had to do all the same sacrifices and the things of the old covenant today, man, such a burden. You've got to keep going year after year and continually making all these sacrifices for something that would never really truly work. But by one offering, what Jesus did on the cross, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. It's amazing. And praise God for that. Again, as the one and only mediator, that's what Jesus has done for us. He has stepped in between God and men, and he has offered up that perfect sacrifice. And everyone for whom Christ has sanctified as mediator, he also intercedes for. Look, go back a, a few chapters in verse, I'm sorry, chapter 7, verses 23 through 25. Again, I know we're looking at a lot. Please just keep with me here. We're trekking along. Um, chapter 7, 23 through 25. It says, The former priests, on the one hand, existed in greater numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. But Jesus, on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, in light of that, because he holds his priesthood permanently, therefore, he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Jesus, as our mediator, has interceded for us in his one offering. But it wasn't just in the one offering in which Jesus intercedes for us. That offering is a permanent offering that covers our sins for all time. And Jesus can always point back to that. Whenever Satan would accuse any of God's people, God can always point back to that one offering that has cleansed, perfected for all time, those who are being sanctified. He intercedes for us regularly, because he always lives to make intercession for them, those who draw near, those who have been sanctified. Jesus always continues forever because he is the eternal high priest who saves completely those who draw near to him, those who have been sanctified by his perfect sacrifice. Now listen for just a minute, because this is super important. Everyone whose sin has been atoned for on the cross are those for whom Jesus intercedes for. I'll say that again. Everyone whose sin has been atoned for on the cross are those for whom Jesus intercedes for. Look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, 
starting in verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God. Check this out. Who also intercedes for us. So if you go back to the, the first part of verse 34, Christ Jesus died. He died for us. He was raised for us. He's at the right hand of and of, of God the Father, who also intercedes for us. Those for whom Christ died are those for whom he intercedes. And every single person for whom Jesus intercedes for will forever be saved. Why? Because as high priest, as mediator, he has secured an eternal redemption with his own blood. And it is through his death and intercession on behalf of the people he has atoned for that ensures their forgiveness and eternal life. The death of Jesus and his shed blood actually brought about true forgiveness. It actually accomplished a real and an eternal redemption. How? Because the man Christ Jesus, go back to 1 Timothy, you probably thought we never were getting back there. 1 Timothy 2, look at verse 6. How did Jesus actually accomplish a real and eternal redemption? Because he gave himself as a ransom for all the testimony given at the proper time. The giving of the Son and the propitiation that he has made, the removal of God's wrath, was made possible because Jesus gave himself as a ransom for all. And as we've been talking about the last few weeks, the Universalists would take this passage to mean that Jesus actually paid in full the ransom for every single individual in the whole world who has ever lived. And they say, see, Jesus gave himself as a ransom for all, therefore everyone's going to be saved. Again, we know that cannot be because if Jesus actually paid in full the penalty for everyone's sin, then everyone would in fact definitely be saved. But we know he didn't do that because not everyone will be saved. Think about it for a minute. When you go and make a purchase of items at the store or online, do you actually make a purchase or do you only potentially make a purchase? I mean, have you ever done that? You go to the store, you put things in your cart, you're rolling around the store and you get up to the checkout counter and, well, I'm just going to go ahead and take these items. Well, no, no, you're not. You have to pay for them first, right? I mean, anyone who does that is a shoplifter, right? You actually have to take out payment and give it to the person who you need to give the payment to, right, in order to actually acquire what you're trying to purchase. But when you do that, when you make an exchange and you give money for a purchase, you are actually buying those things. And whatever it is that we purchase, it's now our own possession. It belongs to us. Listen, this is the exact same language that the New Testament speaks of when it talks about the atonement of Jesus Christ. Look at Titus chapter 2, 11 through 14. It says, Titus chapter 2, verse 11, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men instructing us to deny ungodliness, worldly desires, to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. And then go to Revelation chapter 5, 
Again, this is a verse we've looked at several times, not only in our study here in Timothy, but in other uh, sermons. But it's, it's such an important passage looking at the atonement and what Jesus has done. Revelation 5, again, these are the elders and the creatures worshiping. Verse 9, and they sang a new song saying, referring to Christ, the Lamb, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals. For you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. Jesus purchased people from every tribe, from every tongue, from every nation. They were actually purchased on the cross. Jesus actually did redeem a people, as we see in Titus, as his own possession. He purchased people with his blood who were made up of all kinds of people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. Jesus did give himself as a ransom for all, but again, as we've said many times in our study, the word all must be qualified. Otherwise, the universalists are right, and absolutely everyone will be saved. Again, going back to 1 Timothy, again, we see in verse 1 and 4, the phrase, all men is best understood to be all kinds of people, and following that same method of interpretation that would lead us to also see the usage of the word all here in verse 6 is best understood in the same way. Jesus gave himself as a ransom for all kinds of people, which is in line with his intention to save all kinds of people, which is what we see all throughout Scripture. And we see it here in Revelation 9-5, where Jesus actually did purchase people from every tribe, tongue, nation, all kinds, types, ethnic classes, social classes of people. Now, as we look here in 1 Timothy chapter 2, the word ransom here is actually a compound Greek word, and as such has been intensified for greater emphasis. It means that Jesus did not merely pay the ransom, which he certainly did, but he himself was the actual payment being substituted for the ransom itself. And I think it's, it's clear Mostly in the English translation of the text, we can see some of that. But the idea of Jesus actually being our substitute in the text can be easily missed, and that's what the Greek word highlights. Jesus is our substitute. And why, some of you would ask, why is that important? Because again, it shows all the more that we cannot read this passage to say that Jesus was the ransom for every single individual. Why? Why? Because if on the cross Jesus literally became the substitute and bore the wrath of God, then for whomever Christ has done that for, they are no longer responsible for their sin. If Jesus substituted himself, if he on the cross made the ransom payment, exchanging his perfect righteousness for sin, then for everyone for whom Christ has made this exchange, they will, in fact, be made righteous. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God. Now, some will say, hold on a minute. I'm not a universalist. But I believe that the death of Jesus made salvation possible for everyone. And to that, I would say, if that is really what you believe then you would be supporting a potential atonement and not an actual atonement, which goes completely against everything we see both in the Old and the New Testament about what Jesus actually accomplished on the cross. It was not a potential atonement. It was a real and actual atonement. Jesus really did purchase men of all kinds and types from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And again, some will say, well, you know, Jesus, what happened was, he wrote the check for the payment of everyone's sin. But you have to go to the, to the bank to deposit that check in order for the payment to cancel out your spiritual debt and your debt. 
And on the surface, that could sound good, but the real question is, what does the Bible say? You're not going to find one single verse in all of Scripture that even comes close to supporting that analogy where Christ, he wrote the check, and you go take that check and you put it in the bank. You won't find anything in Scripture that says that. Not, not anywhere. Instead, we find the opposite. We don't deposit the payment that's been made on our behalf into our account because Christ has already done that. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 2. We briefly looked at this in our study of the book of Colossians, but it's so important as we look when we're talking about the atonement here. Colossians chapter 2, 13 through 15. I'll give you a second to look and to get there because it's so important. And if you're not going to turn there, just please listen with me. This is so important. Colossians 2, 13 through 15 says, When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh... He made you alive with him, having forgiven us all of our transgressions. Verse 14 is key. Having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of the decrees against us, which was hostile to us, he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. The debt was canceled when Jesus bore the wrath of God on the cross. He already made that payment in full. It was previously canceled. Verse 15. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. Jesus made the full and final payment for sin, which canceled out our debt for everyone who believed. It was a debt that we don't take the check and put it in our account and the payment's been made now that we've, we've done it. No, this text says the exact opposite. He's the one that canceled that debt. It's not something that we still have to do. The atonement of the God-man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all kinds of people, again, was a real atonement that actually paid in full the penalty for sin and it canceled out the certificate of debt that stood against us. Again, that's so awesome to think and to really reflect on what Christ has done for us. It's significant because it's important for us to see so that we can have a better understanding of what the scriptures teach us, which will help us to truly see and appreciate what Christ has done for everyone who would cling to him, everyone who would believe in Jesus. And this is good news. It's good news that Jesus actually paid in full the penalty for our sin, that he actually already canceled out the certificate of debt that stood against us. This is really the truth and the message of the cross. And again, this is the hope to anyone who believes. Any single individual in the whole wide world, across all times, if they hear the gospel and they experience the full conviction of the Holy Spirit leading them to cry out to God in genuine belief and repentance, they will be saved. That's good news. It's good news that God desires that all kinds of people to be saved. And Jesus died that all kinds of people would be saved. So God desires that all kinds of people would be saved, and Jesus died to save all kinds of people. And of the different kinds and types and classes of people, it doesn't matter who you are. Whoever confesses Jesus as Lord and believes in their heart that God raised him from the dead will be saved, Romans 10 and 9. And again, the reason this is such a wonderful truth is because Jesus, our high priest, our mediator, has interceded on our behalf. And he made an actual atonement for our sin. So praise God that when Jesus entered into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, he knew exactly what he was going to accomplish on Good Friday. 
Praise God that that's what he knew he was going to accomplish. It wasn't a potential anything. It was an actual atonement. And he knew that, having determined himself to go to die on that cross. And him knowing this fact, again, that his death would bring about many sons to glory, was a part of the joy that was set before him that led him to the cross. Look at what the suffering servant passage says in Isaiah 53, 10 and 11. But the Lord was pleased to crush him. God the Father was pleased to crush Jesus, putting him to grief. If he, Jesus, would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. Because he actually atoned for sin. He knew what he was accomplishing. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper his hand. And as a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, as he will bear their iniquities. So how do we apply this to our lives? Well, again, thinking about what we see in 1 Timothy 2, and the whole focus of those first eight verses, we can be more confident to pray for the lost because Jesus has made a full and complete atonement for sin for anyone who believes. So we preach the gospel, we proclaim to every creature the good news of Jesus. And anyone who responds in faith and repentance, who believes in that message, will be saved. We can be confident in that. We know that anyone who turns to Christ and trusts in him is going to experience that reality in their life, just as we have. So this week, I want us to reflect on what Jesus has done and all that he has accomplished. And I want us to continue to rejoice because we've been forgiven. He has paid the ransom for our death. And we live victoriously through him because... He's our mediator, and he always lives to make intercession for us. And as, as a result, he has and will save us forever. Let's pray. Lord God, I know that um, this morning there's a lot that we cover. There was so much that we could not get into. Um, it's hard to cover your entire word in one sermon. You just can't do it. Um, but Lord, this is such a big topic. Lord, I know there's been many things that have been said that have maybe been very challenging and hard to understand. I know there's probably some people here that don't fully agree with what was said. But God, I just pray that your word would continue to convict us all. That your word would help us to see what, you're, what you have actually communicated and what you've actually done for us on the cross. Lord, that we would, in humility... Uh, reflect on these things. Again, even if we disagree or maybe have a different understanding or don't fully understand what was being said, Lord, I pray that you would give us all understanding and you would help us to come to a greater knowledge of these things, not just so we can be puffed up and know things or whatever, but Lord, that we would truly grow in our knowledge of you to really continue to appreciate and love you for who you are and all that you've done. And so, God, I pray that this message this morning would humble us all and help us to seek you and to, to love you and, and to honor you and appreciate you for the wonderful kindness of your mercy and grace. Lord, I pray that we would not be complacent in, our, in the command that you've given us to pray for the lost. I pray that we would continue to go and proclaim your good news to every creature. That there wouldn't be any type or kind of person that you would put before us that we would say, no, nah, I'm not going to pray for them. Uh, there, there's no way that they could ever be saved. That's not for us to decide. If you can save a terrorist like Paul, you can save anyone. So God, I pray that we would remember what your word says and we would cling to these truths and we would be more bold to pray for the lost. And just leave the work that, that you have for us. You would help us to be faithful to that and the things that are that only you can accomplish. Lord, help us to leave that with you. 
God, we love you and we praise you and we thank you. And we just lift all these things up in the great name of Jesus. Amen.